have with us global board member Linda Chavez. She is president of the Becoming American Institute, a nonprofit public policy organization in Boulder, Colorado. Ms. Chavez writes a weekly syndicated column that appears in newspapers across the country and is a political analyst for Fox News Channel. Among her many career and professional accolades, in 2000, Ms. Chavez was honored by the Library of Congress as a living legend for her contributions to America's cultural and historical legacy. In January 2001, Ms. Chavez was nominated by President George W. Bush for Secretary of Labor. In addition, she has served as the Chairman of the National Commission on Migrant Education, the White House Director of Public Liaison, and the Staff Director of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. In addition, Ms. Chavez from 1992 was elected by the United Nations Human Rights Commission to serve as U.S. expert to the U.N. Commission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. Thank you, Ms. Chavez, for joining us for the topic of United Nations and Beyond International Collaboration for Global Justice. Thank you. In the world today, we currently have the most wars in history, the highest number living in poverty, the largest refugee crisis in history, and issues such as terrorism and human trafficking are pervasive. What is or should the role of the United Nations be in addressing such large-scale global justice issues? Well, the United Nations is not the ideal institution to be able to take on some of these issues directly because it is made up of member states, some of whom are, in fact, big abusers. They violate the human rights of their own citizens. And so it is sometimes difficult to get to the kind of consensus uh, and to move forward with uh, programs to kind of uh, end uh, the abuses that take place. Because in some instances, those abuses are being fostered by the very governments that sit at the table. Uh, and sometimes the best change to bring about uh, is regime change. And so it is very difficult for the UN as a body to be able to undertake that task. Hmm. And do you consider the United Nations to be the most effective vehicle? You've mentioned that perhaps it's not. But are other IGOs or NGOs more important for present and future justice issues? Well, I think NGOs and IGOs uh, are important, NGOs in particular, uh, in trying to draw attention to the problems. I mean, when you're talking about, for example, the human rights abuses that occur uh, in many places around the world, in states like Iran, North Korea, uh, Syria, uh, other places, it really has been important for NGOs to be able to open the eyes of the world to be able to focus on what's taking place. Now, in some of those countries, like North Korea, uh, they're very close societies and it's very difficult to get information. But, um, you know, having the United Nations, I was at one time a special rapporteur uh, for a study uh, that was done by the United Nations on a certain group of women who had served as sex slaves during World War II. Uh, they had served um, uh, in that capacity because they'd been forced into it uh, by the uh, Japanese uh, imperial government of the time. Uh, now, you know, uh, it, it is important for the UN to take on those responsibilities to go out and to investigate what's taking place, but often the best information will come outside of government sources and from NGOs. And what do you see as the greatest challenge and the greatest opportunity for nations to collaborate on these types of global injustices? Well, I think there really ought to be something like a confederation of democratic institutions. We have NATO, and certainly uh, NATO is made up uh, entirely of countries that are democratically elected. Uh, however, NATO exists for self-protection. It is a, uh, a treaty that uh, binds member states to uh, basically stand up for each other if any one of them is attacked. Uh, its focus is not on human rights. It would be good to have uh, an organization made up of democratic countries uh, that in fact uh, attempted to use the means at their disposal, whether it's sanctions, whether it's uh, pressure being put on governments to change their policies. Uh, and frankly, I think that would be more effective in many ways than having a body that includes, as I say, some of the bad guys, some of the wrongdoers. And what do you feel is the role of the developed nations? Should they have a greater role in addressing these global injustices, or what should their role be? Well, I think the uh, developed world, certainly rich countries like the United States, like the United Kingdom, like Germany, like uh, many of our Western allies, have a very important role to play. First of all, 
we have a leadership role in that we should, by our own behavior, give example to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the United States and our democracy has inspired many people around the world uh, to try to model themselves after us. And so I think we do play uh, that kind of informal role, but we also play a formal role. One thing we should not be doing is enact policies that prop up uh, these uh, bad regimes. Uh, back during the era of the Soviet Union, the United States uh, Congress enacted provisions that made trade with the Soviet Union more difficult uh, because of their human rights abuses. And so we use the levers of government to be able to apply pressure. And ultimately, over time, um, there were many factors that led to the fall of the Soviet Union, but some of the role uh, does in fact go back to the fact that we were so focused on human rights uh, and particularly with respect to the uh, human rights violation against the Jewish community uh, in the Soviet Union. And that played a very important role, I think, in the downfall of that regime. Now, you have dedicated your work at the Becoming American Institute to addressing issues related to immigration. And what can the international community do to address that particular concern? Well, immigration is, as you know, a very contentious issue in the United States. We are an immigrant nation. Unlike many of the uh, democracies that now exist in Europe and other places, these are countries that have very, very long histories. Uh, our country, uh, as a nation state, has a very short history. Uh, we're, you know, barely over 200 years uh, uh, in existence as our own separate sovereign nation. And so, um, you know, we uh, did not have a huge population. There were, of course, the Native Americans, American Indians, who lived, uh, indigenous people here in the United States. But most of the people who live in the United States are descended from people who came else from elsewhere. Uh, and we have always had uh, an open, open arms and have welcomed people uh, to come and help build this nation. Unfortunately, over the last few years, uh, I think the tone around the immigration debate has coarsened. Uh, I think the rhetoric has become very harsh. And I think uh, we have at least a portion of the U.S. population uh, that is less amenable to being uh, welcoming to newcomers. And I think it's very important, uh, I as a conservative, uh, believe that uh, immigration and the free movement of goods, trades, money, and people uh, is important uh, in the world. And so I think we benefit when we welcome people who want to come here and build their lives. And so my role as the president of the Becoming an American Institute is to try to go out and take that message to my fellow conservatives to try to convince them that this is not just good for the immigrants that we welcome here, it's also good for America. And you have also studied extensively and are completing a book on the situation in North Korea. What lessons for the international community can sh you share about this situation? Well, North Korea is uh, perhaps the most brutal uh, regime uh, in the world today. I guess I'd put it on a level uh, slightly worse than Iran, which is another country that has uh, terrible human rights abuses going on, uh, because North Korea is such a closed society. Uh, as bad a situation is in Iran, you can in fact go into Iran, you can travel around Iran, and you can uh, have access to information there. The same is not true in North Korea. North Korea also has a whole uh, prison system, a gulag really, uh, reminiscent of the gulag in the Soviet Union, which uh, has, we don't really know how many, but the estimates are somewhere in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million people uh, who are basically forced into slave labor camps, and they are worked to death. Um, they're not fed properly. Um, they produce uh, what goods uh, North Korea is able to export. Recently had a friend uh, tell me that she had just come back from China, and one of the people that she works with in China had presented her with uh, several toothbrushes. And he was very proud uh, to say that the toothbrushes were so cheap because the labor wasn't performed in China, it was performed in North Korea. Uh, I told her the likelihood was that that labor was not paid for, that that labor was probably slave labor, and that those toothbrushes had probably been made in the slave labor camp, and she was horrified. Um, so I think we do need uh, to be focused uh, on what's going on in North Korea. North Korea also presents a tremendous threat to the rest of the world because it's a nuclear nation. Unfortunately, the United States 
which did in fact have uh, sanctions in place and did in fact pressure uh, as much as was capable of pressuring North Korea uh, not to pursue nuclear weapons, but we uh, abided by a, a very badly negotiated nuclear deal with North Korea promising uh, to give them uh, some benefits, uh, basically humanitarian aid, in return for their not producing a weapon. Uh, they claimed that they were pursuing uh, nuclear exploration uh, for the purposes of energy, uh, and we bought that line. Unfortunately, we're in the same position now with respect to Iran. We're in a similar situation where a treaty has been negotiated, uh, although the administration doesn't want to call, call it a treaty, but an agreement has been reached uh, be between uh, uh, basically uh, six uh, of the uh, uh, six states uh, and Iran uh, to slow their nuclear development. And these issues are very, very difficult and very complicated. Unfortunately, the people who live in these closed societies are the people who suffer most. And finally, Ms. Chavez, um, given these various concerns that we've covered and also some of the um, ideas that you've shared, how would you summarize the best ways for the UN and the international community to collaborate on addressing these concerns? Well, first of all, I think that, uh, as I said, the UN is hamstrung. Uh, the UN, in my view, may not be the best institution. Um, when you have uh, countries with competing uh, objectives, uh, you have the Security Council of the UN, uh, we have on that Security Council some regimes that are not in fact democratic, uh, or not democratic um, in the case of, of Russia, for example, they may have elections, uh, but elections are not the only thing that define democracy, the rule of law, uh, and uh, individual rights and protections, uh, I believe are fundamental to determining whether a country is democratic. But we have those, um, those nations who are in a position to be able to veto uh, any actions that the United Nations take uh, with respect to uh, outlaw nations. Uh, and so it's often difficult for there to be meaningful enforcement, even when we decide uh, that human rights is important to us. It's very, very difficult for the United Nations uh, to be able to play that role. I think it's more important for those democratic countries uh, that have relations uh, with the world uh, to try to exert their own pressure, uh, to try to do bilateral or multilateral uh, actions uh, that uh, try to pressure governments that are violating human rights uh, to stop doing so. And it's also very important for democracies to support democratic movements within nations that are not currently democratic. Uh, and uh, to try to give hope uh, and support uh, to the people within those countries who want to bring about change in those nations.